Hello and welcome back to Never Too Late. I am your host, Debbie Wright. This week we are talking to two battle buddies, Darren Tassander and Tom Wright, and they are going to speak to us about their experiences working in a war zone. So uh, you all met Tom last the last couple of weeks, so we will just go right to Darren for a moment there. Darren, uh, what was your job in Bagram, Afghanistan? Uh, I was hired with uh, a company called uh, Blackwater Aviation at the time to be an aircraft inspector for the aviation portion of their business. So you just did inspecting, you didn't do any of the mechanical work on the airplanes? Uh, when I first got there to learn the aircraft a little bit, I did do a little bit of the the, the uh, work on the aircraft for just a, just a few weeks just to learn the aircraft more. Then after that, yeah, it was all just an inspection, but we all kind of did whatever we had to do to get things done. So I would help, um, I would help with things sometimes, yeah. So you made sure that the mechanics did their job right and the pilots would stay in the air? Pretty much, yeah. I, I made sure that the uh, mechanics were following the procedures correctly, log books were signed off correctly, all the paperwork was the way it needed to be, so uh, that the next day the missions could could uh, commence without any issues. How did you and Tom meet? Tom was one of our pilots and every day they would bring the log books, they would fly their missions and they would bring the log books in to me and I would have to look them over um, before they took off to head back to their to their barracks or their quarters. So we started talking from that point. Uh, we were together over there for at least close to three years, I would yeah. say. Yeah, yeah, about three years. Yeah. Well, here's an interesting question, just because I'm curious, because I know sometimes, you said you're not a mechanic, but sometimes the mechanics and the pilots didn't always see eye to eye, so what did you think of each other when you first met? Tom, you go ahead. You probably uh, can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, a bit leery, because uh, uh, Darren was in charge, you know, he was one of the upper guys in maintenance, so I figured he'd be, you know, a real stickler as far as, and he, w he was professional, but I figured he'd be uh, one of those people you, you really didn't want to work with because it, you know, just nag you to death. But that turned out not to be the case, and we got to be really, really good friends. Yeah. You know, basically, we would accuse the mechanics of not fixing the aircraft properly. They would, have, they would accuse us of purposely breaking the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So we'd find a common ground somewhere in there and laugh about it. And Darren, what did you think of Tom? Uh, Tom, I liked Tom from the from the very beginning. And most of the pilots over there are pretty personable, but some of them are, you know, a little bit uh, uppity. Divas. Some of them are a little full of themselves, is what you're saying? Some of them are a little full of themselves. You know, a lot of them ex-military pilots sometimes can can uh, mm. be a little uh, highfalutin, I guess you could say. But most of the pilots I got along with really well. And then, of course, living together in in an austere environment, you you get to know people differently than you would in a civilian setting because we lived together, we went to the same gym, we ate lunch together, we ate breakfast together, we all lived in plywood bee huts together. So it's a little bit of a different, different uh, relationship than what a normal aviation centered job would be. So you're we, almost together 24 seven. We were seven. actually what I would call real teammates there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You cover my six, I'll cover yours. It's, it makes a big difference compared to the civilian world. And you talked about Darren living in a bee hut. Explain <laughs> what a bee hut is. A bee hut is basically a plywood shack that is divided into eight rooms that are about eight foot by six foot, seven foot jail cell size and they're basically divided by a ply by just one sheet of plywood so if a guy in the next room is talking on the phone with his on skype with his wife or farts too loud or something like that <laughs> you're hearing it so we would go into these bee huts and that you know the the walls only went as high as the plywood so the ceilings were open so we would go in and modify them and and close them in and try to make them as comfortable and, and private as possible. But they were just basically plywood shacks. And there's no insulation? 
Um, I, I yeah, I would say there's insulation that would have to yeah. be because it gets really cold. Yeah, they eventually sprayed that spray insulation. Some of them had a had a foam coating over the top of them, but yeah. mine didn't. Yeah. And then so there's an air conditioner. In the there's a center hallway, four rooms on each side. There's an air conditioner on each side up by the door, but you didn't have private air conditioning into your own room or anything. So did it stay fairly cool in there? Yeah, we would try to run little space heaters, but it was always break popping the circuit breaker. So we would go go home on leave. We would bring back bigger circuit breakers, <laughs> and we'd go to the electrical panel and swap them out so, so that the breakers wouldn't pop all the time, which is probably yeah. pretty dangerous. The bee huts were built. They they would make the World War II wooden barracks look like modern hotels. Yeah. The bee huts were built to not last very long. They were built to a very slight budget by the lowest contractor. And what were your beds like? Uh, children's bunk beds. Yeah, a little single bed. Uh, just a little single bed. Yeah. Okay, fairly good mattress? Uh, no. Hundred dollar no. hundred hundred dollar mattress. Cheap mattress. Yeah, they got the mattresses off the local economy. Um, I mean they were just mm. everything done over there. They would even put the buildings together below grade, which means when if it rained real hard, some of the bee huts would flood. It's just, you know. And of course, there were no bathrooms, so you would have to, in the winter time. a lot of people think Afghanistan is like a, a hot desert, but in the winter at 5,000 feet, we got a lot of snow and muck yeah. and rain, and if you had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you had, to, you had to get dressed and put your boots on and wade through the muck to either an outhouse or go a little further to the shower house, but uh, yeah, it was... And so, then if it was night, you'd never sit down in the outhouse. Oh no! So you never knew what you were sitting in. They were so nasty. I think that's why I don't. Ha I've never caught COVID. Yeah. <laughs> After those outhouses, I think I'm immune to everything. Between that and the burn pit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what other kind of living quarters were there? Because I know there was other things besides bee huts and container. Well, there were the containers, regular old uh, Mersk and Air Sea Land shipping containers, and the uh, uh, facilities guys that had the contract would come in and they'd weld a couple of them together, cut out the center wall, and actually put a little bit of aluminum paneling in them or something, or I never lived malamite. In one, so. yeah, and, and they would, I, I stayed in one in uh, Iraq, and it wasn't bad, but you're still sleeping basically on top of your buddies. Yeah. And our offices were all built out of sea containers too, yeah. or not sea containers, but shipping containers. The shipping containers. Yeah, all of our offices were stacked on top of each other like Legos, and we'd build stairs, and then our offices were all built inside shipping containers. But then after, what was it, I don't know, it was probably there two years, maybe two and a half years, when they finally, the company finally built us the Hilton, we called it. Out of shipping containers. <laughs> out of shipping containers. But that was nice, because we had our own rooms with our own air conditioner, and we didn't have to go outside to go to the bathroom. And they had to build them because the base was tearing down all the bee huts. Yeah. They wanted to make it nice enough so when we pulled out, they would leave something nice for the uh, locals. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> what, were, what were the meals like? Did you have different places you could eat? Was the food good? We had th two main mess halls and an army tent. Actually, I guess we had three plus the army barbecue on our side on our side we had the we had the barbecue defect yeah until it closed we had the army defect we had the dragon defect and the air we force went up up the street yeah, yeah. and what, what's the dragon one dragon well they called it the dragon defect because it was right across from dragon building which was all the different areas of beehats had names oh okay and uh and uh it was all it was it was decent food. We'd have we'd have believe it or not lobster, crab legs, and steak every nice. fr every Friday yeah. night. It was nice. uh, surf and turf they called it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But after a while they got rid of the lobster, replaced it with crab, and yeah. then after a while they got rid of the 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 Friday night surf and turf. Yeah. As the war went on, everything that supports the war is done by contractors. Contractors want the job so they'll bid lower than whoever has it so in order to bid lower the food gets a little bit worse or when they did away with our sandwich shop in the mess hall yeah it used to be one of the problems we had is we would have to be on the flight line before the mess hall opened 
So the sandwich shop would be open. We could go and build ourselves three or four sandwiches to take with us throughout the day because we miss, miss breakfast, we would miss lunch, and we'd be back for dinner. Then they got rid of the sandwich shop, so a lot of us with on the early schedules, the early flights, we didn't eat all day. We'd get one meal a day, uh, even though that was considered to be part of our pay. And Darren, um, being on the maintenance side, did you have a problem? I never had issues like that because I was always there where I could go get, these guys were off flying early and be gone all day. Um, then we had, we also had a pizza hut. And was it a good pizza, like American pizza? It was, was you it know, different? they were all, could you get big pizzas? I couldn't remember. I think they had regular sized pizzas. Yeah, the regular, yeah, well, there was a lot of nice little fast food restaurants until who was a general crystal came in yeah that was before i got there and shut everything shut down. everything down then we got a popeyes chicken we had the green bean coffee place and on the other side of the base there was a burger king and it, but it was in a you know it was in a contact it was in a shipping container of course yeah but uh and it was using local meats yeah. So there, it wasn't. It was a good facsimile of American fast food, yeah. but it wasn't American fast food. Yeah. Well, I'm curious about the Popeyes chicken. Was it? What we, kind of chicken was it? We, we was it chicken? It looked more like pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like at the steaks on okay. Friday night. Yeah. It showed up. It was flown in, and several times I watched them unload these things, and right on the box was stamped for institutional or prison use only, yeah. not the, for sale. The steak all said that too. Yeah. And it was like the lowest quality meat they could get. Yeah. The all contract. The lowest bidder gets the contract. So after a while, most of us gave up eating the steak. I mean, we'd switch over to whatever else they might have that night because they always had a selection of food. I got to the point that uh, I will not eat anything with curry on it anymore. <laughs> we did have the Afghan restaurant too. Was it called Aziz's? Yeah. Which was an Afghan food restaurant that was up on our base. What is Afghan food like? It's, you know, there's a lot of rice and then of course sheep, goat. Um, it was pretty good, actually. I liked it. And since then I've eaten Pakistani food. It's kind of a mix between Indian, Pakistan, Afghan food. It's all kind of similar. But uh, yeah, I like it. I liked it. For, it was good. But uh, then you get the bread, you know, the flat bread. Yeah. Foot what bread, they, we what do they it, call that? We call it a foot bread. Remember? Yeah, they, said foot they, bread. Yeah, it they need it with their feet. <laughs> <laughs> we, would, uh, we would fly down to, what was the base? Kabul? No. Or uh, Kandahar? No. If you're facing towards Kabul, it would have been off to the left through the mountains. Mazar Sharif? No, that was way up in the other direction. Anyway. Sharana? Uh... Okay, remember guys, people are listening, <laughs> yeah. to you, listening to you trying to figure out where you are. Anyway, they we would stop there and if we had any time on the layover, the little Afghani shop there sold the flat bed, flat bread. Flat bread yeah. So that was pretty good. We, yeah. would, we would chow down on that. Did you put anything on it? Uh, no, he didn't mm -hmm. have anything to put. Any, any, he would have nothing that we would trust. Yeah. But I mean, how, what could they do to bread? And mm -hmm. it's not really bread, it's more like a, a thick tortilla. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's good. It was good. Mm -hmm. And so, to to help us out with meals and stuff like that, most of us would get, I'm going to call them care packages from home, and they might be a couple of jars of peanut butter or ramen something noodles. like that, ramen noodles, yeah. anything that, that would help. Oatmeal. You know. Oatmeal. Yeah. I'm sure, yeah, Tom did not get oatmeal, I guarantee that. <laughs> no. He will not eat oatmeal. I tried it once, and it was, and... Everybody that I was working with, the guys, they were they were eating oatmeal. They put syrup on it and berries and stuff, and it looked really good. So I, I fixed a bowl like that, and I tried it, and it was just as nasty as what my mother used to feed me back in the fifties. <laughs> it was horrible. That was pretty much it for food, unless you, unless you could get a one of you guys went to Kandahar and bring back some Tim Horton donuts. Oh, Tim Horton donuts. That was that was always a treat. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, at Kandahar, they had a TGI Fridays for a while. They had a Kentucky Fried Chicken. They had the boardwalk. They had the boardwalk, yeah. But you got cookies sent from home. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Care packages. So what was it like just actually living on base? What, oh, okay, let's say, what was, what did you do for entertainment? 
I know you had a day off once in a while. What would you do? You These guys had lots of days off. Yeah. Darren, you didn't get any I days off, but the pilots did. Uh, <laughs> we, well, by, by FAA regulations, we had to have so many, so many hours off and you know, limit your flying to so many hours a day. Uh, there was a little PX there, and it was a small PX. It was one of the cases you'd go over there for entertainment just to watch the other people try to find toothpaste because toothpaste <laughs> was in short supply. If, if it was on the shelf, you better get it because it'd be a month before you'd see it. There was uh, a couple of shops, they're all Haji shops, uh, with knockoff CDCs of programs and movies. Yeah, that DVDs, you know. DVDs, and they were being sold right there on base, yeah. even though it was... But what about our band? You had a band? The, do you remember our band? Yep, Mike Mullis and a couple other guys, Darren. There was like four of us, and we all played instruments. And of course, our our mission over there was we were STOL, S-T-O-L, short takeoff and landing aircraft. So I came up with the name. Mike Mollis was kind of the most musical of us. So I named the group Mike Mollis and the Stool Samples. <laughs> <laughs> and we would get together and, and, and play music. And if we had cookouts, we'd play music. And actually, we ended up playing at a funeral. Yeah. Remember there were that? quite a few cookouts. Uh -huh. On the, on the deck um, to the office yeah. and of course it was locally sourced meat so it was good to have a cookout and everybody the camaraderie but it was still not it just was a little bit off-center as far as the food taste it was good yeah. and you were appreciative of it there were a lot of good times there a lot of good friends of course the gyms they had the gyms yeah so we spent a lot of time in the gym uh, uh, other than that entertainment uh, you know when you got a new uh, DVD you know, you'd look at it a couple times, pass it around. Yeah. Or if you could get on uh, Pirate Bay and download a pirated movie. Oh, but, yeah. But the internet was so <laughs> slow that it would take, I mean, you'd start the download before you went to work, and then 12 hours later, you'd come back, and it might be done. <laughs> yeah. Sniper Hill. Sniper, Sniper Hill. Hill. And horrible internet. internet. It was just fast enough where you could Skype or FaceTime back home if you had to. Right. But, you know, the hours we worked were generally long enough that you really didn't worry too much about entertainment on a your off time. You wanted to rest because yeah. you'd, you'd be up at 4 in the morning and you might not finish your day till 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, every night. And that's the pilots. What about you, Darren? What, what uh, I was working, hours? I'd work usually 12-hour shifts, and but we'd go to the gym and then head back to your, you know, eat, eat dinner. Head back to your room, watch a movie, maybe talk to the wife on the phone, go to sleep. Ignore the air raid sirens. Yeah, we ignore the air raid sirens yeah. and take cover, Don IBA. You could always tell the new guys from the guys that had been there for a while, especially in the chow hall, because we'd be in the chow hall and then you'd hear, incoming, incoming, incoming. And all the new guys would dive under the tables, and us guys had been there for several years, but just. Eating. Yeah, we'd, we'd look at the new guys and, and keep eating. <laughs> yeah, but you were the new guys once, and I bet you did that too. Uh, yeah, I remember my yeah. first air raid. I was coming out of the shower house, and I did run for one of the hardened shelters. Well, the, the scariest one I had, the church and one of the uh, army oh, units. It was a Pat Tillman coffee shop. Yeah. yeah. Built mm -hmm. this little coffee shop out of plywood, and you could yeah. go in there, and for donations, you could get a cup of coffee. Yeah. Uh, then you go through the gate and go out to the, the mm -hmm. ramp. I had just stopped in there. It was about 4.35 in the morning, got my cup of coffee, heading out to the airplane, and there was a big co whoop mm -hmm. fireworks just right out by the runway. Mm -hmm. And that was my first exposure to yeah. uh, having rockets shot at us. Yeah. And after that, it was, hey, this is kind of neat. Let's go out and watch. And they would hit us every September 11th, and they would hit us every holiday. Yeah. And then the one... Remember the one that hit our airplane yep. in the hangar? That was a September 11th attack. And it went, the rocket went right over my barracks because I heard it go, <laughs> boom. And then the shell casing lodged in the tree, remember? Mm -hmm. And then the one rocket landed outside the hangar. There was guys in there working, but it didn't detonate, luckily. But it split in two, went through the hangar, hit the back of wing of our aircraft, and went through the other side of the hangar and didn't hurt anybody. But it had it exploded, it probably killed everybody in there. But yeah, we were constantly getting getting attacked. And then, then the fateful night of November thirteenth or uh, November 29th, two thousand thirteen, which was 
Thanksgiving night, yeah, 2013, when a lucky rocket, lucky for the Taliban, hit our barracks. Yeah, dead, c- and Al. dead center, killed Al almost instantly. When Kitty died in surgery, and her, what's scariest thing for me about that was her room was originally my room, and we traded because she wanted to be on the ground floor. Mm-hmm. But so. No, yeah. Too bad. Yeah, that was a bad night. And when they weren't shooting at us or sending rockets our way, they would be up at o dark thirty in the morning singing prayers in Arabic, on yeah. with the loudspeakers. Yeah. So you never got. Was that like on an Afghan side or something? Yeah. How would they allow? It was a town them? right outside. Yeah. Oh, it was the, the town. Yeah. Okay. And that and that was constant, yeah. whether it was a holiday or not. Every morning before sunrise, yeah, you they were over the loudspeakers singing singing prayers. So you never got a really long good night's sleep. Sleep with your floods in. So I want to go back to the um, the mortar that didn't explode, it didn't detonate. Mm-hmm. Did somebody have to come and defuse it? No, it, it when it hit the it hit the ramp about twenty foot outside the hangar door and just disintegrated. Oh okay. and just fragments yeah. and okay. it didn't detonate but it fragmented and then yeah. pieces of it went through the hangar, hit the airplane. Yeah. And was oh. the airplane total? No. You were able to fix it? No, it hit the flap, it hit the out flap, did some damage. That was, you know, that was the, uh, that was the, the Dash 8, the one that uh, used to be Dick Cheney's airplane. Yeah. 308, the, what was the company that we were flying missions for? What were they called? It was a big secret deal. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. It was a secret. I probably can't talk about it. They didn't tell, I didn't even know what it was, <laughs> yeah. but, um, yeah, all the mechanics and pilots that worked that they had to sleep. They had to go down to a different barracks. You know? yeah. yeah, and not allowed computers, cell phones, yeah. anything because it was so high security. Yeah, I can't remember what that was. Uh, it was just the NGO or NGA. NGI. NGA or NGI. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Non-government agency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for those listening to this podcast, remember we said we're having a conversation with these two battle buddies, and that's what you're hearing. You're just hearing their conversation where yeah. they're. Trying to reminisce and remember. <laughs> yeah, that happened over 10 years ago. So. <laughs> yeah. Memory. Darren, what's the worst damage you've seen on an aircraft? Oh, gosh. Remember the Casa that got hit? Um, it was a Nevergreen Casa 212. You've got pictures of it. I've got lots of pictures of it. Um, a rocket went through. The, and now, this aircraft was parked on the ramp, so nobody got hurt. But the rocket went through the left engine, completely through the engine, punched a hole through it. Creating a lot of shrapnel. Through the fuselage, bounced down the runway, and lodged in a King Air. That was probably the worst. That airplane was totaled. Yeah. They they took it apart and shipped it out on pallets. And some of the uh, damage by the munitions that don't explode, the uh, bad guys, the Taliban, Afghanistan's or whatever, they were using stuff that had been buried for years. This was old Russian ammunition. Yeah. And when the Russians left, they left all their equipment behind, kind of like we're doing now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a history of arming our future enemies. What, so, about, what about an aircraft that was in flight that got damaged? Uh, I've seen a helicopter take a 50 caliber round through the tail, and they didn't even know it until they landed and did a walk around. And then the bullet, it was uh, one of our um, S-60 S-61s. Ones. And, and that was brand new. They had to do a whole new tail boom, as I recall. I don't think so. It, it went through it. It missed the drive shaft. Yeah. I've got pictures of that, too, because I left the exit window by about six inches wide. Yeah. And it missed the drive shaft by like an inch. And it went through the rotors, Yeah. the tail rotors, without touching them. Yeah, I remember seeing that. Hmm. Um, gosh, I, we've, we've seen a helicopter on the other side of the base, Chinook, get hit by a rocket one time when it was getting ready to take off and watched it burn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there'd be a lot of bullet holes and stuff, but yeah. nothing like you would expect. An aircraft can take a lot of damage. Yeah. So, you know, generally a bullet hole, a bu- if a bullet hit, it, unless it hits a cable for a flight control or a fuel Plus line. our aircraft run, you know, the, the consoles run pressurized, so. Yeah. What is your best memory of being at Bagram, Darren? <sighs> My best memory? I don't know, probably Christmas uh, 2012, when that was about the only Christmas I didn't get to come home, and we had a uh, 
me and the maintenance supervisor had a contest to see who could decorate our ends of the <laughs> of our office the best. You know, we made I had lights and made snowflakes out of I had stuff all over the. Place. I had a little fake that. fireplace made. And so you had an arts and crafts day. I won. Oh, congratulations! Yeah, yeah. I did win that. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, what's your best memory? I would say all the friendships meeting me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <Darren. laughs> what's What's kind of nice about it is everybody that was there was there because they wanted to be. They weren't drafted. They weren't forced into it. Um, the contractors, you mean? The not, the, not the military. Well, you know, the military, they're all well, volunteers, Well, it is too. a volunteer, yeah, you're right. But as far as contractors, everybody thinks, well, they're here for the money. Well, not really. If you no. break it down for the amount of hours you're there, you're only making about $35 an hour compared to a plumber who makes 35 an hour. It's just that we're working 24-7. Yeah, mm -hmm. away from our families and getting shot at. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. but, but the best memory is probably the camaraderie. And I don't think really there was really any true friction between any of our guys you know you'd get have an argument occasionally or whatever but everybody was really they would back each other up uh, we were all in it together you know that's a that's a cliche nowadays but yeah. we were in it together and we had each other's back and that to me best friends I've ever had yeah I made some really great great friends lifelong friends yeah yeah you're still in touch absolutely with. And I've helped, you know, several of them get jobs where I'm working now, you know. So, you know, I recommend these guys highly. If you need a job, call Darren to Sander. Yeah, I'll help you out. <laughs> and there's the advertisement for today. Yeah. Let's switch it the other direction. What about a worst memory? For me? Yeah, yeah sure. Tom could go first. The worst memory? Probably uh, getting on that third-rate airline in Dubai to fly to Bagram. There were scary airplanes. They were almost as bad as the airplanes in Africa. Uh, I mean, these pilots basically couldn't speak English. Not sure that they were really qualified to fly a 737. Hmm. Uh, well, you could have just gone up there and helped them, maybe. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> you know, but, you know, being a pilot, I'm not comfortable anywhere but a cockpit anyway. You know? But I would say, uh, the worst memory is probably uh, when you land in Bagram and you got to stand there for I don't know how long while they pick up your cat cards and check your ID. Process you in, basically. Process you in. Yeah, that's that's probably the worst, mm -hmm. other than the bathrooms. <laughs> bathrooms. What about you, Darren? Um, that was pretty easy. I was on duty when the rocket hit our building. It's me, me, and uh, one other guy. So I had to go to the hospital and ID the bodies of mm. my friends. Oh, Al, yeah, Al and tough. Kitty. Okay, mm -hmm. I didn't see Kitty. She died in surgery, but I did. I did ID Al's body. Mm. And then also watching the helicopters land on the flight line and pulling those American soldiers off, draped in American flag, mm -hmm. and seeing those young guys dead, knowing that their parents don't even know it yet. Mm. That was that was pretty rough. Yeah, I got were you, I got goosebumps. Were you there when they brought in the uh, Chinook or the the all the crew the people who were on the Chinook? I was. Or, yeah, we when got the, I, when the the Navy Seal helicopter went down. Yeah, and they put it in our hangar. And they yeah. brought all the the they landed across from us. Yeah. In the in transport and unloaded all the the caskets. Yeah. That was so sad, and then put yeah. and this giant helicopter, the Chinook, when they brought the parts back, it would fit in one little shipping container. Yeah. There was nothing mm -hmm. left of it. One one more good thing I did see that was amazing. Yeah, in, let's switch back to good things. In history, <laughs> I, just, I think this is worth bringing up, is I watched him fly Bin Laden's body off the base the day mm -hmm. after he was shot. We were on the flight line, as before we moved to the other end, mm -hmm. and an Osprey came in we never seen Ospreys at Barbara yeah. and landed, didn't shut its engines down. I saw a flurry of activity at the C-130 hangars and saw them bringing stuff out and then it took off and was gone. And I, I remember thinking, wow, I wonder if they put his body on that and mm -hmm. come to later find out they had. Yeah, because they had trained all the guys that yeah. did that mission right so, up at the NGA place. That was a pretty good experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you think they really went and dumped him in the ocean? I don't think they did. 
No. <laughs> I don't think I think he's on ice somewhere, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> no. What do you guys think now about the troops and everything have abandoned Bagram and left it to the Afghan people? Without getting political? Go, without without <laughs> getting too political, I guess, please. Oh, that's... It's a, it's a war we can't win, and we shouldn't, since we're not going to attempt to win the war, we shouldn't be there. But on the other hand, we should have kept that base because we've kept our bases in Europe as platforms to for other missions we may need to do in the future. We should have kept that base, as Darren said earlier. In your conversation earlier, not yeah. on the podcast yeah. earlier. Right. Strategically, it's perfectly placed for us. We sunk billions of dollars oh, into yeah. it, and we lost thousands of lives. And to just abandon it like that, if I would lost a kid over there, I'd be really pissed right now. We, we should just pay Afghanistan a rental fee for the base like we do in Japan and Korea and Germany and kept the base as yeah. a base of operations, quick response, whatever we need in the Middle East. Okay, so trying not to get political. <laughs> why why did they just totally abandon it? Just just because somebody promised that all the troops would go home? Probably. Well, with the downswing in the war and the slow withdrawal, I think people were tired of the war. We've lost too many people. But I don't think uh, that uh, the military industrial complex saw a profit in it any, anymore. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that probably a lot. You know, people don't realize it. But but the contract world, it started back when McNamara, who was with DuPont, I believe, brought in plastic canteens. And he started the trend of using contractors for the mess halls, even in, even in basic training in Fort Knox, as an example. We had contractors, which frees up the military personnel to do military missions. It's time that we're out of there, but we should have kept the base. We should have kept the presence over there. Exactly. Yeah. We don't need to be going after Taliban or anything else, but we need a strategic stronghold. Is there anything else you guys want to add before we close? Anything that you wished I had asked you? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Now's your chance to <laughs> let it rip, unpolitically. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was pretty much through my comment in <laughs> yeah. about seeing Bin Laden flying off the base. <laughs> As a civilian, what did you think of the war? Um, Tough questions, uh, huh? Yeah. This is my podcast. You're not supposed to ask okay. me questions. <laughs> Um, to be very honest, I really didn't know what it was about. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. That's probably why so many people wanted the troops to come home because yeah. they didn't know what it was about either. I I don't think a lot of people did, and there are people who were over there that didn't know what it was about, just like Vietnam. It's like, yes, sir. Can you tell me why we're over here? Can you tell me why my yeah. friends killed? I got a buddy that was an army ranger over there, and he said he really didn't wasn't bothered by anything until he went back there as a civilian contractor and seen that nothing had changed. Back and to they, Vietnam, you mean? No, to Afghanistan. Oh, yeah. When he was over there as a ranger fighting with his friends dying, then he went back as a civilian and nothing had changed and mm -hmm. that affected him more so than anything. So it was anything. all for nothing. Yeah, yeah. that's what he feels. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for doing this. I think I hope you guys enjoyed it a little bit. Yeah, I know you guys talk about it all the time, but this time we're <laughs> yeah. just actually getting it on tape. So yeah. I think my takeaway from this is it is never too late to support your military. Even though you guys are older and you can't, well, you could have if you'd been in, you know, been in the military, but you still went over there to support our military. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you both yeah, very enjoyed much. Enjoyed it. And, um, we will talk next time. Bye-bye. Right.